You're listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Hello, my name's Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Oh, that was a very strong Lionel. And Daniel Freib. Hello, chaps. How's it going? That wasn't very strong, Daniel. You okay? I'm sick again. You sound dreadful. Yeah, you? I am dreadful. I am dreadful. I feel ill just listening to you. I made... Well, I didn't make a joke last time I was ill, but I made a comment and um, someone didn't appreciate it, so I'm not going to make any comments on it. I can't comment on my illness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's up, to, it's up to us, Rich, to keep the energy levels up. Yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Mm. Uh, well, let's let's. I mean, we do. I, I say this every week, but we do have lots to talk about uh, this week. Uh, Lionel raises his eyebrows. We, we've actually abandoned our plans for this week, which was for me to be reporting from Paris Nice. Uh, that will be next week's episode, I, I suspect. But the three of us have uh, reconvened, um, and let's kick things off with your news roundup, Lionel. Great racing at the weekend, the Strada Bianca in uh, Tuscany. Two great races on the white roads. The men's race was won by Michal Kwiatkowski of Team Sky. Michal Kwiatkowski. 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 I'm going to take issue here because I'm not Polish, right? And that's a, that's a decent stab at that. Calm down, Lionel. I unfortunately am Polish. I'm half Polish and I can't get anywhere near. I can't even get in the vicinity of... A correct pr- pronunciation. That was a decent stab at the, the Polish rider from Team Sky. He actually, the way the peloton has got around this is, is by calling him Kawasaki. You know that, <laughs> don't you? That he's actually called Kawasaki in the peloton. Very smart. Very mm. smart. Perhaps we should adopt that. Mm. It's a true story. Anyway. anyway, he won ahead of Greg Van Avermaet and Tim Wellens. A real uh, ding-dong of a race. Um, you guys will talk about that in, I think, the first part of the podcast. The women's race was won by Eliza Longo-Borghini ahead of Poland's another Polish rider, Katarzyna Nuvadoma. She was second, and Lizzie Diagnan, uh, formerly Lizzie Armitstead, was third. When do, we, when do we drop saying formerly Lizzie Armitstead? Everyone knows that Lizzie Diagnan no. is Lizzie Armitstead, right? Yeah, we'll drop that now. Um, in other racing, Adam Yates of Orica Scott won his first race of the season, the Grand Prix Industria e Artigianato in Italy. Wow. That was all right, wasn't it? That wasn't bad, was it? Wow. And uh, Jos van Emden of Lotto Jumbo won the Dwarsdor West Vlaanderen, which is also known as the Johan Museo Classic. What a great name. Um, not to be confused with the Dwarves d'Or Vlaanderen. No West or East implied, which I will be at in a couple of weeks' time. Paris Nice is off and running, cracking couple of stages to start the race. Arno Dimar won the opening stage ahead of Julian Alaphilippe. Um, really split to pieces the opening stage of Paris Nice in the crosswinds. Quick Step did really well getting Ala Philippe, Philippe Gilbert, and Dan Martin right up there. Uh, less good news for Roman Bardet of AG2R. He was kicked out of the race for a combination of holding onto the team car and drafting the team car sitting behind the team car, holding on to it, pretty much... Getting in it. Get, he didn't quite get in it, but near enough. Um, and he was disqualified. That was all because he crashed and was struggling to get back up to the group. But, uh, yeah, uh, caught red-handed uh, from the overhead um, pictures and kicked out of the race. We've just watched stage two. Philippe Gilbert had a real go at trying to steal the yellow jersey, but he was caught. There are another couple of little moves on the run in, but the Italian sprinter Sonny Colbrelli of Bahrain Merida won. It was a real grueling, tiring looking sprint, wasn't it? Uh, but he held off John Degenkolb on the line. Richard, you're off to Paris Nice in a couple of days, which would be very nice, I think. Lots to talk about when you get there. Um, hope it stops raining for you. Thank you. Is that the end of the news roundup? Ah, yeah. Keep it brief this week. We've got loads more to... Mm. Just as a footnote to the news roundup, can I make a correction, an erratum from last week? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I mentioned the fact that Peter Sagan, or I thought that Peter Sagan this year had spent a period at altitude before Het Newsblad for the first time. I was wrong. He actually did the same thing last year, but it was it was all new to him last year, but um, obviously worked because he decided to do it again this year. A Roman Bardi style mea culpa there, Daniel. Well done. Uh, we, we will talk. We're averaging one of these a week. <laughs> well, at the least, quite good, and isn't it? Loads that we don't mention. <laughs> we 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 will we will talk about Bardi and Pyrenees in part two. We're going to turn our attention to. I think we're going to talk about Strada Bianchi in part one. Um, 
part three, something you didn't mention in the news, but the latest um, news and allegations, revelations surrounding Team Sky. There were a few of them last week in the DCMS Select Committee, and that just missed the episode. But there were more at the weekend, and uh, we'll, we'll turn our attention to that in, in part three. Uh, lots to chew over there. But Stradibianchi, I mean, that was a great weekend for Team Sky. Uh, Miha Kwiatkowski won the race, second time he's won the race. Everybody says it, it's becoming almost boring, but it's such a fantastic race. And I have to say, the women's race too, which I watched on my Eurosport player without commentary. And, and it was a, a crime, really, that more people couldn't watch that race live because it was a, an absolute belter of a race. Uh, Elisa Longo Borghini won it, Italian rider on the Wiggle High Five team. But it was a real cracker, a, a, a really exciting finale. The race was in the balance for a long way. And it really was, I think, a measure of how far women's racing has come that it served up such a a race that was so, uh, such a hard race that was so open right to the end. And it was a cracker. Um, But the men's race was very entertaining too. And I think it was Inner Ring made the the suggestion on Twitter that um, why not hold the World Championship road race on the Strada Bianca course one year? It does serve up fantastically exciting racing. And it has this, it's not quite unique, but, Milan San Remo, we see it as well. This this it suits this combination of talents. It's got the stage race riders, the climbers, and the one day specialists. There was Tom de Moulin, not a rider we see up there in too many one day races, but there he was, right in the thick of it. And it's proof that if the course is tough enough, good enough, selective enough, it doesn't need to be 250 kilometres to serve up a great race. I think uh, the men's race, 175 kilometres, isn't it? Which is, on the short side, it's a, it's a good deal shorter even than the likes of Het Newsblad. So, um, yeah, there's a, they, they've really um, hit a very successful formula with that race. Not just the white roads, but that finish now into Siena. And I was in Siena on holiday in, um, in September and, you know, walking around um, that, the central part of town there and seeing the road where they go up. I mean, it's a great, a, it's a, almost an amphitheatre for the finish. And that um, final climb, particularly in the wet, I imagine slippery back wheels and all sorts. So it's a, it's a you know, it's an exciting race. There's plenty of action, plenty of drama. Um, and I imagine, you know, uh, the, the quest, we, we always talk about this, the Grand Tours are always looking for unusual terrain, unusual territory. You know, I think the next big thing will be for the Tour de France to visit the, uh, the Ribin, the Ribinou, uh, the, the, the off-road sections of the Trobro Leon. We'll probably talk a bit, little bit more about that later on in the spring. Just, just on the course, chaps, I mean, um, it, it is unusual almost unique in professional cycling in the, this particular race in the way that it brings different types of rider together i mean i, I got a, a bit of a theory on that remember last year we talked about how um the, the difficulty of judging the world championship course comes in part from the fact that it's that every world championship course is brand new and you don't have a hundred years worth of history which instruct your ideas um, preconceptions about how the race is going to pan out. And I kind of think that with um, Strade Bianche, there's still not really a clear fixed idea among direct sportives, among riders about exactly where the key action is going to take place, how it's going to take place. Um, it is a bit of a, a blank canvas in that respect. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, you, you get riders, for example, at Thibaut Pino. Um, uh, a guy who's not raced an awful lot in Italy before, but is going to race an awful lot in Italy this year. But he's not the kind of rider who you expect to go well on a one-day course, but he goes into a race like that, Strade Bianca, at the weekend, um, with no preconceptions about not being able to compete, not being able to to do well. And, and that also applies to some riders who are much more kind of sprintery type riders. And consequently, you get this really interesting amalgamation of of different types. Yeah, I mean, Pino was ninth, but other riders that fit into that category, Tom de Moulin was fifth, Tim Wellens was third. These are not necessarily riders that you would immediately pick for a classic type race, whereas Tish Banut, Greg Van Avermaet and Kawasaki are. But I, want, I wonder if, you know, this is a symptom of it still being a, a pretty new race. I wonder if over time... Well, that's what I mean, yeah. yeah. if over time, the, the, you know, it'll be... The, the, the type of rider who wins, it'll be sort of narrowed down. I don't know, though, uh, because, you know, Milan San Remo, I guess, is another race where you do have a combination of riders who can at least contend for it. So perhaps there are just courses that can, you know, suit more than one kind of rider. 
thing about Strade Bianca is that in, in the history of that race, the young history, short history of that race, I don't think I've ever seen a team be able to take control of that race. Um, it's, it's very unusual at any point really in the last 50 or 100 kilometres to see even three or four riders from the same team on the front setting a pace for a captain. Um, it does seem to sort of degenerate or escalate to a bit of a free-for-all quite early. It's like Pyro B in that respect, but Pyro Bay has that, that tradition, that expectation, I suppose, about what sort of rider can perform there. But we see when Tour de France goes over the cobbles, there are always some riders who excel on the cobbles. Vincenzo Nibali in 2014, Tony Martin a couple of years later, who perhaps you know you wouldn't have automatically chosen to be good cobbles riders and if they were to give Pyro Bay a proper go as you know we believe Tony Martin will this year could be capable of surprising themselves and other people the cycling podcast is supported by science in sport science in sport fueled by science Thank you very much indeed to our sponsor, Science and Sport, for their generous support of the cycling podcast. Grateful to them and especially grateful to them because they're they're doing a special offer for friends of the podcast. Thank you very much to everybody who's signed up as a friend, thecyclingpodcast.com. If you have, you will be sent, if you register for it, a £14 goodie bag from Science and Sport, a bag containing £14 worth of Science and Sport products. How's about that? Wow, that's... Do the math. worth more than a year subscription to the Friends of the Podcast scheme alone. So literally, you sign up for £10, the cyclingpodcast.com Friends scheme, and you get a £14 goodie bag. I mean, that's, you know, so you're, you're in credit, and you get... And you get our 11 special episodes 11 that we're going to make episodes. over the course of the year. It's the amazing. first two are already out, aren't Hard they? to believe. That it, sounds dangerously close to what we would usually call crime. To what, sorry? Crime. Sounds like crime. Crime. So, so advantageous. Mugging, the listeners are mugging us. They are, aren't they? <laughs> They're literally mugging us. Uh, well, the, you can still you can still take advantage of that offer if you get if you're quick and you haven't already signed up as a friend of the podcast. Go to thecyclingpodcast.com this week, and I think you'll still <clears throat> if you do it this week or in the next day or so, you should still be able to claim your fourteen pound goodie bag from Science and Sport. You'll get an email from us telling you how you do that. So, so there you go. For everybody else. Uh, all those people out there who don't want to become a friend of the podcast, I can't think why you wouldn't. Um, you can get 20% off Science and Sport products, as indeed can friends of the podcast, I should point out. All listeners to the podcast can get 20% off Science and Sport products by entering the code TCP20 at the checkout when you go to the cycling po- at scienceandsport.com. Scienceandsport.com TCP20 is a discount code got that out there in the end Lionel you look like you were going to say something well I was just going to say one of the reasons if, if people are having trouble with the TCP20 <coughs> code I believe that it doesn't work in conjunction with any other existing offers so it only works when you're buying like full price products so if the code isn't working just check that you haven't added stuff to the basket that uh, mm. is already subject to some kind of offer but thank you science and sport for that uh, very Uh, Very generous indeed. While we're on subject of giveaways and competitions and so on, I should, uh, I just want to recall last week's episode where I rashly promised a Rafa jersey uh, to the winner of a competition that I thought up on the spot. And that was to identify the rider who Daniel did an impression of. Now, Daniel, who was it? Daniel deliberately had decided not to, not to reveal the identity of. So, ah, ah, that could be a problem with the competition then. Very unlike you, Richard, to rush ahead with something and unilaterally decide what was going to go into the podcast. But <laughs> you don't have to confirm it, then, Daniel. But I've, I think it was Stephen Croiswick, and we had a lot of uh, guesses. Stephen Croiswick. If you don't have to confirm, you've got deniability here, Daniel, and that's always uh, important in cases like this. You've got deniability. I'm going to say it was Stephen Croiswick. I don't know if it was. No idea. Uh, but we had a lot of uh, nominations for. Stephen Croiswick, I will give the Rafa jersey to Stuart Bowker. Stuart Bowker. Um, please drop us a line at contact at thecyclingpodcast.com and we'll uh, arrange for you to get a jersey. And ho- hopefully Rafa will give us a jersey for that. Or I could be out of pocket. On to part two of this week's podcast. And uh, Pyrenees, I'm off to Pyrenees tomorrow. It's been a really exciting couple of days racing Pyrenees, helped by the inclement weather, strong winds and 
and, and rain and cold. And it looked, as you said earlier, Lionel, a gruelling sprint at the end of stage two, a really slow motion sprint, guys in, uh, you know, leg warmers, tights and, and, and rain capes. It was odd to see. But the main talking point so far, I guess, was the expulsion after stage one of Roman Bardet, uh, who had crashed quite heavily and uh, took advantage. You know, I mean, <laughs> if you're going to do that, look around and check there's not a helicopter, you know, with a camera trained on you. <laughs> Um, and he's, you know, the, it, it show, I mean, there's a few things came out of this, I suppose. One is the 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 willingness of of the organisers, although it's the 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 jury, the race jury, of course, to the decision to expel fr the French darling in a big French race organised by the organisers of the Tour de France, and Bardet's reaction to it, which I think most people admired. He turned a situation where, you know, he he would have been looked up on very poorly for inverted commas, cheating. Uh, but he turned it around with the, the graciousness of his apology that he posted on social media. First point, Rich, you make there about the organiser. I mean, the jury will be the UCI jury, so the nationality of the rider the, and the, the location really shouldn't make any difference. But, you know, in the history of cycling, we have seen hometown decisions made. Um, you know, um, if you go back to 70s, 80s, 90s. I mean, I'm not going to not going to cite hometown decisions, but, you know, that there might have been pressure um, to uh, not come down quite so heavily on Roman Bardet because, you know, he's a he's a big name French rider. He's a big the first big French stage race of the season, but correct decision. Um, you know, I think the the thing that really came out of the Sunday stage and again, Monday stage, we're talking on Monday afternoon, is the willingness of the riders to really race very, very hard. The Sunday there were crosswinds, it was rainy, it was cold, cold and rainy again today. Um, we've seen cold, wet starts to Paris Nice before where the riders have been all togged up in, um, you know, leg warmers or tights, heavy gloves, you know, all wrapped up. And really the, the, sta the stages have been pretty perfunctory. They've just kind of trundled along the, you know, fitting the, the, uh, the template of small, meaningless break going away. Uh, and then being caught and then having a sprint. And you could have anticipated exactly that playing out over these two days, really. And yet we saw incredibly aggressive racing. Quick Step Floors really tried to exploit the windy conditions. They managed to put riders very well up there overall, particularly Julian Alaphilippe and Dan Martin. It was aggressive. The race could have been lost, well, has been lost by a lot of riders on that opening stage. And so if we're going to just put mm, something in the... Are you sure about that? We'll see. Well, we will see, but you know, there's some riders who are five, six, seven minutes down. I mean, they're yeah, they're yeah, probably okay. out of it. But and and Bardet was clinging on really by his fingernails, and then the crash came at a very bad time. And then there's a big difference, you know, perhaps by the letter of the law there shouldn't be, but the spirit of the law. There's a big difference um, between getting yourself back on in a in a period of the race where nothing's really going on and actually trying to get back up to a group in the closing 30 kilometers when it's full on you know unfortunately crashing is part of bike racing and if you crash at a bad time you risk losing the race and it was a, it was an error of judgment by his team and by him to try and take advantage of the team car in the way they did the fact that it was you know so obvious made the decision of the jury very easy um but we can't have a situation where races are decided by people you know taking significant drafts or or you know the sticky mechanics banner magic spanner um you know that's just not but it's a bit like the dis the brief discussion last week about riding on towpaths i mean it's not the same but it's the same in the sense that there are a lot of rules in cycling that exist that are rules but haven't always been applied and it, the thing is to apply them and we've seen with nibali and, and with bardet the rule being applied, it can only be applied though when it's spotted by television cameras. And that's still a, a, a thorny issue, I would say. But I think you, you can only, the technology is there, you can only act on evidence that is conclusive. And that was conclusive evidence. If a rider does get away with it in a, an earlier phase of the race, you know, unfortunately, you know, unless he gets dobbed in by uh, riders from another team or there's, you know, there's some kind of official complaint, it's very difficult to take action. But the, the wider point here is that cycling in the grand scheme of things is, is fighting for airtime, fighting for relevance in terms of, a, of being a sport that people will give up their afternoons to watch. 
And I think everybody is acutely aware or is becoming acutely aware that if you have a situation where basically it's reduced to a farcical spectacle, people will start turning off. And, um, you know, that they had no option but to chuck Bardet out for that, in my view, I think. I agree. I agree, Lionel. Straight red card for me. Well, one thing I would add about Bardet is that, um, you know, he apologised. He was very gracious. He was rightly applauded for that. But really, um, the the culprit, at least to the same extent as Bardet, was his team and his direct sportive and the driver of the car that he clung on to. And to be fair, ag 2 rs manager, Vincent Lavenu, acknowledged that um, that they were very much or encouraging him to hold on to the car and get a tow. So really, people's ire should be directed at them. Um, just going back to the racing itself, uh, Lionel, um, when the Paris-Nice route is announced, we always automatically look down to the bottom of the map and south of France and we look for the climbs. Um, there's the, well, later in the week, we've got the biggest or the, uh, the highest climb ever or highest summit fi- finish ever in Paris-Nice, the Col de la Cuyol, 1,678 metres. We always look down there, but actually it's not uncommon for Paris-Nice to be almost decided in the first week 1999 Rabobank absolutely ripped the race apart in on the first stage I think it was a similar part of France or very close to where the race was yesterday 2004 CSC did the same and in both cases um, those teams leaders went on to win the the race quite easily so not unusual and certainly worth focusing on if you are a team you're a team like Quickstep with two candidates for overall victory like Dan Martin and Julian Alaphilippe and then also riders who are adept at riding in the wind and, and that sort of middle part of France the bread basket of France we've seen time and again over the last few years in the Tour de France as well it's very very exposed and very very susceptible to echelons um, so any team that was caught out or completely taken by surprise by what happened uh, yesterday or on the first stage was, was slightly naive, I would suggest. And just on the teams that really excelled, quick step were outstanding, but Arne Demar looks to be in incredible form, uh, the winner of Milan San Remo last year. And FDJ for a, a team that's been almost derided and mocked in the past for their lack of ability in crosswinds. Thibaut Pino has been caught out on numerous occasions in the Tour de France. Um, they've been almost dominant in the first two stages, which is quite a turn up for the books. Demar would never hold on to a team Well, I was going to say, funny, funny that the winner, no, funny that no. the winner on a day that the French favourite was thrown out of the race for holding on to the car was none other than Arnaud Demar, who was alleged to have held on to a car during Milan San Remo last year on the Poggio. And I think, one of the things that, that people thought in relation to, to that win at Marseille was that DeMar, they may, perhaps didn't have him pegged as somebody who would get up a climb all that well. And I think he showed something at the finish of that first stage of Pioneers that I haven't seen in him before. He really looked like a complete rider. To, to, to bridge up to Philippe, who's you know no mean finisher himself, um, and then you know really you know, out-muscle him in the finish was really very impressive. And to drop guys like Dan Martin, Rich, on yeah, yeah, Dan on Martin a and punchy and, you know, climb that should have been perfect yeah, for him. I, I think we've seen that sort of thing from Christoph before, haven't we? Especially Tour of Flanders a couple of years ago. But it makes you wonder what what else Demar might be capable of. Whoever you are, whatever you ride, whatever the reason, Rafa exists to improve your ride with the finest kit, inspiring stories, and vibrant clubhouses and communities all over the world. Thank you very much to our main sponsor, Rafa, for their generous support and for giving us that jersey for our competition winner. I hope, hopefully they will. They they did, when I when I retrospectively told them about the competition, they said that that was great. I could get a 10% discount. I hope that was a joke. But Well, so do I, but it's coming out of your pocket <laughs> if it's yeah, not a joke. It is. Uh, you know... Um, I live and die by what I say on the podcast, Lionel. Sorry, Don't we all? Lionel, isn't it? Don't we Don't all? We all? Well, that's a, a good um, sort of a way to to embark on this third part of, t- of this week's podcast because we are turning our attention once again to the ongoing uh, shenanigans uh, at Team Sky, the, the revelations, the allegations. The, they're coming thick and fast. We thought there was quite a lot that came out of last week's DCMS hearing uh, with... 
Simon Cope, the Jiffy Bag Delivery Man, and Nicole Sapson, the head of UK Anti-Doping. But there was more at the weekend. To bring us up to speed, Lionel, can you just basically tell us what's happened over the last week or so? Well, yeah, this is back in the news again because the Department for Culture, Media and Sport Select Committee hearing into doping in sport convened again. Um, This is a hearing chaired by Damian Collins and the three people who were supposed to appear last week were Simon Cope. As you say, Richard, he was giving evidence about his flying visit from Britain to the Dauphiné Libre at the final stage of the Dauphiné Libre in 2011 and the package in a jiffy bag um, which has been at the centre of this entire story. The head of UK anti-doping Nicole Sapstead also gave some uh, very interesting information about the progress of the investigation into Team Sky and British Cycling. Uh, Dr Richard Freeman who was also supposed to appear uh, didn't do so because of ill health Um, but he will be asked to answer some questions in writing by the committee. Since then, there's been a lot of newspaper coverage and some of the key revelations or allegations um, have been published in, for example, the Sunday Times, which reported that 60 to 70 vials of triamcinolone were delivered to Manchester Velodrome in 2011. Triamcinolone is the corticosteroid which Bradley Wiggins applied for a therapeutic use exemption for so he could use it ahead of the 2011 tour the 2012 tour and the 2013 Giro d'Italia the Sunday Times also reported that some testosterone patches which are banned in sport had been delivered in error to Manchester Velodrome and were sent back same day the Sunday Times has also reported that a former Team Sky doctor Alan Farrell changed a password to prevent Dr Freeman applying for a fourth TUE for Wiggins ahead of the 2013 Tour of Britain which he subsequently won and our friend and colleague Tom Carey at the Telegraph reported that Dave Brailsford has said that he was treated with Triumcin alone when he had a knee condition uh, way back in 2008 before the Beijing Olympics. It's also been suggested that other Team Sky staff have been treated with the drug. There's been no comment from Team Sky other than to say they are proud of their anti-doping record. Uh, This story is now rumbling on and on. I mean where are we with it now? Well, where are we indeed? I mean, those, you know, as I said earlier, the the, the stuff that came out of the uh, DCMS uh, hearing last week seemed to take it on uh, quite a bit with Nicole Sapp said, saying that there was an excessive amount of tramcinolone for one athlete. She said it was either enough for several different people or an excessive amount for one person. She didn't say how much there was. David Walsh in the Sunday Times made this allegation that it was 60 to 70 vials. And I guess one thing that, you know, if, if that's not true, and if the story about the testosterone patches being delivered in error, which I must admit really um, raised my, caused my eyebrows to shoot up in, in, in a way that all the other bits of news perhaps haven't, because I don't know how testosterone patches are delivered in error. I've never had testosterone patches delivered in error. And testosterone means cheating there's no gray area there you know whereas triamcinolone is a drug that can be used out of competition and with a tv testosterone is cheating now they say that they were delivered in error um richard freeman reported it to steve peters who was head of medicine at the time and steve peters said that he didn't actually report that to dave brailsford which also seems a little odd well, where, where where does it leave us now? I mean, there's a real groundswell of uh, voices uh, calling for the head of Dave Brailsford, um, the, the William Fotheringham in The Guardian, uh, David Walsh in The Sunday Times been making the case for a while that Brailsford should fall on his sword in order for uh, the team to be able to move on. I'm not sure if that's realistic or if it would help. I don't know. I mean, what... what do you think, Lionel? Well, I think the thing that that really has come out of last week's um, parliamentary um, hearing, it was very interesting that Nicole Sapstead of UK Anti-Doping kind of put into the public domain the suggestion or allegation that possibly it was the triamcinolone which had been transported to France on that last day of the Dauphiné and had been administered to Bradley Wiggins. Uh, Remember in the 
prior hearing just before Christmas, Shane Sutton confirmed that whatever was in that package was given to Bradley Wiggins in the back of the Team Sky bus on that day after the final stage of the 2011 Dauphiné. Now we are, we you know, we are speculating here, of course, but now that it's in the public domain, it's it's fair game to discuss because that is the nub of this entire issue. If that was Triumph Sin alone. And if it was administered on a race day, albeit after the stage, that's an anti-doping rule violation and, uh, you know, could possibly be the mandatory two-year ban. Now, that changes everything. And that would mean Bradley Wiggins being stripped of the 2012 Tour de France and the Olympic title and so on, because he wouldn't have, if, if it had been known at the time, he wouldn't have been competing. Um, so that is the seriousness of the issue. There's only really now one person who can confirm on the record to the MPs what was in the envelope, and that's Dr. Richard Richard Freeman, and he was unwell. And what we know about um, the way that these hearings are held, you, you, you don't get out of appearing before the MPs just because you're, you know, you're, you're a little bit under the weather. He's, a, he's obviously unfit to appear, and we'll have to now answer these questions in writing. That's kind of the, the, the dead end. If, if Dr. Freeman says, no, it was Flumacil, which is a decongestion, not banned, um, if that backs up that story, then we go nowhere. If he doesn't, and he admits that it was Triamcin alone, then this is a whole different story. The, re- the thing about Dave Brailsford is, if he resigns and says, I've handled this terribly, it is an admission, it's going to be seen as an admission of, of guilt and while team sky have the backing of james murdoch who came out and said we're very proud of the team and the team's anti-doping record and so on and so on this message is just being hammered down that they've done nothing wrong i agree i agree lionel it would be possible to infer from his resignation that there's an admission that there was specific wrongdoing done on that occasion in the team bus on the final day of the dauphine in 2011 However, there are other grounds for him to resign. I think the the the, the testimony that Nicol Sapsa gave about the, the record keeping at the at the National Cycling Centre, the, the failure by Richard Freeman to keep records of even what was coming in and out of the, the medicine uh, room at the, the velodrome was very damning indeed when Brailsford was his manager, was, was you know, lo- looking after him. The thing that staggered me about the story in The Telegraph from Tom Carey, Brailsford saying that he had used, been given Triumcin alone to treat uh, a bad knee. Now, when we spoke to him, Richard, in back in October, I think it was, he said that he didn't associate Triumcin alone, which is a corticosteroid, with doping. He, you know, but, but not at any point, not at any point, not to us, not to the MPs, as he said, oh, yeah, I've been given this as a medicine. So I thought it was a medicine. If this is a drug that's at the centre of this story and he's been given it as a medicine, I don't understand why he wouldn't say, well, look, I've been given this as a medicine. I didn't think anything was untoward. And so that raises another, if not a red flag, certainly an orange flag in, in the whole explanation. The, the, the explanation of this story from the start has been a shambles. And they, it's... Every single turn, no turn has made them look better. Every single turn has made them look worse. No, I think and not only Lionel did Brailsford say that he didn't know what the drug did. I think he, did he not say that he didn't know what the drug was or hadn't heard of it or wasn't familiar with the name Kennecourt? Beyond all of the specific allegations, Rich, which you just, you just enumerated some of them, I think they're it's it's much more simple than that in from sky's point of view um you you sponsor a cycling team uh, to try to promote your brand image and obviously central to that has got to be credibility and otherwise there's no point there's absolutely no good reason why a team would get involved with professional cycling if there was no credibility to the project you were sponsoring and for, i think for most people or for well it's very difficult to judge but for a lot of people the needle has now definitely turned taken a turn towards a a position of distrust and um you you know obviously there's a contract here between sky and the team and they probably just can't get out 
on that basis, it would probably take something like an anti-doping violation. Well, it would take an anti-doping violation at that point. They would certainly get out. But in terms of, you know, wanting to continue and certainly, you know, the next time they come to renew their contract, um, I would think that they would have to take stock of that and uh, and and realise that a lot of people have lost trust, um, rightly or wrongly, because it's such a tangled thicket now of coincidences and, and uh, sustainability slightly implausible sounding explanations from the um you know the misrecollection of it simon cope coming to meet emma pooley to the lost laptop to the testosterone patches arriving in error and the, and you know there are there are dozens of these things now which you know uh, some of them could be true a lot of them could be true but it, it's starting to sound um like quite a tall story and, and it's just difficult and i think you know probably if they're honest with themselves a lot of people would, uh, sky would would acknowledge that it's difficult now for people to to buy all of this particularly when as they are claiming their hands are tied and they're not being able to face down any of these allegations at the present moment um ucad and the press in particular but m- more the press um are are disseminating these allegations in a vacuum with no response from Team Sky. Go back to the beginning of the team and Dave Brailsford's statement and, and assertion that he was going to try and win the Tour de France with a clean British rider. Um, and, you know, we look back at the very beginning, you know, some of the people that he had hired, you know, didn't fit with the, the you know, the, 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 the recruitment policy, which was that they wouldn't touch anyone who had any association with doping. You know, right back at the beginning, there were people who, um, you know, they'd been involved in professional cycling through an era where it was very, very hard not to have an association with doping, either directly or indirectly. Of course, there was a whole wave of people who left the team in 2012, um, you know, under under a cloud, you know, the, the suspicion that, that basically they had been, uh, you know, they had been involved in doping in some way in the past and so could no longer be employed by Team Sky. You know, there's there's so many of these these things where we've been asked to trust and give the benefit of the doubt that, that Dave Browsford says, I'm running a clean team. So winning the Tour de France with a rider who had been given triamcinolone, which is permitted out of competition and is permitted only with a TUE in competition does not fit with the message that they hammered out in 2009 and 10. And Richard, I know you say all about going up to the line and technically it's not an anti-doping rule violation. Well, it's not an anti-doping rule violation to take Triamcinolone with a TUE or take it out of competition. But that is not the impression that they gave. That is not the... When they talked about how they operated as a team... They gave the impression that they were a long way short of that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, talk, you know, I talk about going up to the line because that's what Dave Brilsford told me in 2010 uh, with some degree of frankness, I have to say, in terms of, you know, how they were going to change things after that torrid first year in 2010. It seemed to me, I'm reading this book, The Undoing Project by Michael Lewis, and he talks about hindsight bias and that, and we have to be careful of that because we can go back and, and you know, talk about various events we've now at this point got a lot of information a lot of knowledge in our heads we didn't know it all at various points in this story well that's exactly the point isn't it and i've said this before christmas that if we had known if it had been out in the public domain that bradley wiggins had been given corticosteroids on pretty much the eve of the tour de france in 2012 when he won it but we we but that Lionel. race would have been covered in a totally yeah, different way. Yeah, but another way. another more important thing. I mean, yeah, using using uh, corticosteroids out of competition may well be legal for a lot of people. It's unethical. Um, is it the reason that Team Sky didn't join the MPCC, where that sort of thing is is you know outlawed? Um, That's the movement for well, credible cycling. And, and you know, with the allegation that there was this vast amount of tramcinolone delivered to the velodrome makes you wonder how widespread its use was. It's also worth, um, and I think important to say, that in 2014, when the CERC report was published, there was a claim in that report that one team had systematically used cortisone uh, as a a weight loss um, uh, thing for riders. Uh, There were rumours, you know, online and so on, that that Team Sky was the team. You were at Pyrenees. You went and asked Dave Brailsford about that specific rumour, and he told you, that absolutely that was not the case, that that was not something that Team Sky did. 
Yeah, he did. I can picture where we had that conversation in Saint Etienne, standing next to the team bus, and, uh, and you know, I asked him directly about that because I'd interviewed him a couple of days prior, and and you know, uh, people had said, "Why didn't you ask him about this particular issue?" And uh, yeah, he he did say that, and <laughs> that was we after. We don't know that they did, but well, we don't know they did. <laughs> where did the rest of this tram synonym go? If that's how much was was delivered to the velodrome, and and uh, I, you know. Let's it, let's suppose for a moment that the reason that this has gone so far and has not been quietened down, let's just say if it was administered on the final day of the Dauphiné 2011, that is against the laws, against the rules, um, and that would get them... They can't admit to that if that was the case. There, there could be a very... You know, there could be a, a very... Uh, simple explanation it could be that dr freeman wasn't going to be with the team on well the this is camp. intriguing isn't it because you know had he you know if we, if we imagine that that is the case and we don't know if it is or not but if we imagine that it is the case that he was administered trams alone on the on the final day of the dauphine before midnight it's an anti-doping offense why not wait till after midnight you, you had a theory about that well, it may well be that Dr. Freeman was, was not going with the team to the, the training camp. I tried to uh, look back through all my notes to see, because you know, I was on that Dauphiné, and I, I, I don't know whether Dr. Freeman was going to that training camp or whether he was going home. Um, I've got nothing recorded you know, at the time. I've tried to find out whether um, he, he was there. Uh, that's proved difficult this week. Um, you know, trying to find out whether he was going to go onto the training camp that the Sky Riders were going to after the Dauphiné, but I've not been able to find out one way or the other. Um, I think the, the, the greyest, darkest area of this is that because the TUE system allows for anonymity, I think they just thought this would never come out and that they would be able to, um, you know, they would be able to use this drug for wh whatever purpose. Um, <laughs> Again, on the eve of Wiggins' biggest objectives of, of his stage racing career, not once or twice, but three times. And we hear that, you know, that he, he uh, if David Walsh's report in the Sunday Times is correct and Alan Farrell's allegation is correct, Wiggins may well have had a fourth TUE on the eve of the Tour of Britain 2013. You know, this is a pattern of behaviour. It's not a one-off. And so, you, you, you know, benefit of the doubt takes another, uh, you know, hammering there. But we would not have known any of this but for the fancy bears hack and leak of the um, the, the, the Adam system, the, the, the WADA computers, which has put all of this information into the public domain. And that, that's the thing that's staggering to me is that, you know, this at the outset was a leak of information that, that looked damning, that, that if there was a logical, clear explanation, that logical, clear explanation could have been given pretty pretty soon after the leak we're now what five months on and and the situation has got worse and not in as i say it has at every turn this story has not got better for team sky no and it's got to the point lionel where by if sky are to cleanse their image at the end of all of this i mean there are so many separate allegations there's so many um small strands to this story that have developed a, a life of their own that they will almost need to produce an equivalent of the USADA reason decision but it will be a reason defense um, a, a point by point um, rebuttal of every one of these allegations going into quite a lot of detail um, and you know you talk there about fancy bears and all of this only coming to light because of well essentially geopolitics I mean we think the fancy bears group has some kind of connection to the Russian government um, and and this is a it's a new development, it's, it's, it's a new dimension to anti-doping. But unfortunately, from the fans and from listeners' point of view, um, I think we just have to reconcile ourselves and, and to, to the fact that this is how anti-doping works now, that it's very rare that we find out that we get answers um, on the spot or even a few weeks or even a few months after the event if you look at the Armstrong case you know we took it took seven years there to get any clear answers and and the same has happened here and no it's interesting you make that point Daniel I mean I was just gonna just throw something else into this because um, over the weekend I tried to 
see if Brian Cookson, the UCI president, would speak to us about this issue. Um, I received a, uh, a reply back from the UCI's press office saying that because of Brian's very busy travel schedule, he may not be available for interview until April. Um, and then received a comment saying that the UCI is unable to make a comment while there's an ongoing investigation. Um, but the it, I'm not really after... Uh, 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 some kind of comment from Brian Cookson about where the story is at now. What I would like to talk to him about is his role in 2011. Remember, he was the president of British Cycling at the time when British Cycling and Team Sky invo- embarked on this PFI project of a publicly funded body having links with a commercial entity that British Cycling funded by the lottery and Team Sky funded by a private company, pooling all of their expertise and resources into creating not just a world-beating domestic team to compete in the Olympics and World Championships, but also a, uh, a road team to try and win the Tour de France. And there was a lot of crossover of staff and skills, and Dave Brailsford at that time held the two key positions. He was the boss of Team Sky and the boss of British Cycling Squad. And this was all put to us as being a great um, you know, pooling of resources to get the best possible results on both sides of the track. And Brian Cookson, as president of British Cycling, was one of a number of people on a board that was looking at potential conflicts of interest between British Cycling and Team Sky. And so, you know, he has gone on uh, to be elected president of the UCI and and made kind of capital out of the fact that he was going to usher in a new era of transparency. Um, You know, he was he was perhaps not publicly, but certainly privately made comments about Pat McQuaid, whose uh, the final years of his reign were dogged by the the fallout from the Lance Armstrong era. And Brian Cookson was going to be the new broom. And he was I want to know from Brian what he knew at the time, because this all happened on his watch when he was involved. Um, You know, he not directly involved but as president of the UCI now it's not good enough for him to say sorry I can't comment. Rich in your book you talked a lot about marginal gains which was the credo of Team Sky um, when they launched and and that, that's something else that's been suggested over the last few days that, that this was all propaganda and I mean I've been back over the last couple of days and read some of the things I wrote in 2011-2012 and you know for example a piece I did at the end of the 2012 Tour de France where everyone had really been blown away by Sky and and blown away by how much progress they'd made since 2010 and some of the things that they were doing you know I spoke to maybe 15-20 people from other teams um, an assortment of teams from different countries France, Spain uh, and so forth and asked them about Sky and their marginal gains and, and never did another team manager or a rider from another team turn around and say, no, this is that they're not doing anything different. Um, What they did say was, yes, they've got more money than us. They've got more manpower than us. We would like to be doing that kind of thing. Also, people saying, you know, how important the the placebo effect, for example, um, was with Team Sky, that this constant talk by their director sportifs, by their managers, about the advantages that they were getting from going to wind tunnels or, or, you know, using different types of clothing, that that in itself could have been quite powerful. Um, and, And I do think that beyond that point, beyond 2012, beyond 2013, teams did well, they certainly didn't mimic Team Sky. And the advantage, those marginal gains were eroded to a large extent because I think pretty much most of the teams are doing what Team Sky do now. But to suggest that, that none of that existed and none of it had any role, um, so certainly in 2011, 2012, I think is probably erroneous still. I, I totally agree. I mean, it's just part of this very polarised kind of culture that we live in where things are either, you know, very bad or very good that where someone is either a genius or a fraud where uh, you know marginal gains is either the the, the greatest thing ever or a complete sham you know the, as with most things the, it's somewhere in the middle but there's certainly value to it let's think about the coverage over this weekend and what impression that is leaving with casual fans or even people who are very familiar with cycling the impression is that sky are being hung drawn and quartered here um the coverage is in keeping with uh, a a doping offence having been proven. And that, despite all of my sort of irritation about how Team Sky have handled this and what Team Sky did um, back in 2011, 12, 13, uh, at at the end of the day, 
they have not yet been proven to have broken any anti-doping rules. And they may not be. I mean, even if they did, they may not be found to have broken the rules. And if that is the case and we, we go forward six months, what is the toll on the reputation of the team and particularly on riders who who may well be entirely innocent of any of anything may not have may not have touched anything that's even in the grey areas their reputations are being compromised by the way this story has played out in the media and the way the story has played out in the media has been enabled by Dave Browsford he, his inability to explain clearly and definitively right at the start has led to this situation it has and that kind of brings us back to where we were at the start of the discussion. Will Dave Brilsford survive this? I think at the moment, all the signs are that they will ride it out. I think the the backing from James Murdoch is significant. The backing from Sky as a corporation is significant. Um, and I think that unless there is uh, an anti-doping rule violation, I don't think he will fall on his sword. Daniel? I would agree with Lionel. I would agree. Everything with Lionel. Lionel said. Wow. First, first, for, first for anything. Everything. This is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Join us on Twitter and Facebook. Just search online for the Cycling Podcast. So there we were, chaps, 24 hours ago, predicting that Dave Brilsford would probably ride out the storm, or try to at least, when a story dropped literally minutes after we'd finished recording, claiming, uh, it's a cycling news story, claiming that there were the stirrings of a, a rider revolt, that riders on Team Sky were so unhappy that they were calling internally for Dave Brailsford to step down. That was quickly followed by a flurry of uh, of tweets from, I think, about 16 out of the 28 riders in the end, supportive of Dave Brailsford. Inevitably, there were some riders who remained silent. Lionel suggested on Twitter that those riders might end up being sent to the Enico Tour as punishment. Uh, don't know about that. Don't know if I can see Chris Froome being sent to the Enico Tour because he was, of course, one of the riders who didn't tweet his support for... Dave Brailsford and you know the rumour is that Chris Froome may well be the principal uh, character behind the the stirrings of revolt I suppose that he's the one who I suppose stands most to lose the more that Team Sky's name is dragged through the mud um, if he thinks that Dave Brailsford leaving might help to repair some of the, 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 the reputational damage um, then that might be one reason for him. It reminds me very much of a, you know, there are echoes of a situation back in 1983 when Bernardino fell out with Cyril Guimard, the Renault, Renault team, went to the big bosses and said, back him or back me, and they backed the boss. Uh, and I think we all understand that that's very much Sky's thinking too, that they back Dave Brailsford 100% at the moment and uh, very little chance of him being being sacked, I think. I think this is where the story might might head. There's a sort of power play here between Chris Froome and, and Dave Brailsford. Well, Rich, I think if if you think back to how Chris Froome's career started and how he grew up as a cyclist, he very much always been a bit of a one-man band, um, even when he discovered cycling really in Africa, in Kenya and South Africa. And then um, his story is very different from that of the of most of the riders and certainly the British riders on Team Sky. I mean, he started off at, at Barla World, then joined Team Sky in 2010, but then um, to all intents and purposes was used as a domestique for the first year and um, was going to be offloaded. You know, he had a deal ready or he had an offer from Cofidis that he was about to accept in 2011 when he went to the Vuelta, had a great Vuelta, and then um, became the Chris Froome that we we've known in intervening years. Um, but it's been a bumpy ride even since then, hasn't it? The 2012 tour, there was the, the friction with Bradley Wiggins and, and Brailsford supposedly eventually convinced Pr Froome to ride for Wiggins. But um, we know that the sort of aftershocks of that conflict on that tour went on for months and years afterwards and Brailsford and, and Froome have never really seen eye to eye over that 2012 tour and Froome continues to be remains a bit of an island in that team um, to the extent that he doesn't have a big entourage of teammates that he um, frequently trains with or and certainly not the same teammates all the time in the way that Grand Tour leaders like Contador do and um, yeah he very much does his own thing so I think that this was almost a, a conflict 
waiting to happen given the right catalyst and this is obviously a fairly serious catalyst the other thing to bear in mind though is that when we come to the tour de france where the media spotlight is most focused on cycling it's going to be chris froome who is answering questions isn't it about sky about his own conduct about the team's policies about the attitude to tues about the attitudes to corticosteroids when you know has he used it when's he the, the reputational damage um that that chris froome risks uh with with you know dave browsford remaining at the team you know there's there is some risk isn't there to his his reputation it's certainly going to put him more sharply in the firing line this summer than he might already be and let's not forget chris froome has also applied for tues in the past to um treat conditions you, you know the, the the story is so confused and muddled and tangled um that the, if they were to if they were looking to try to make a clean break and move on and and try and free themselves of, the, of this entire mess then unfortunately for dave browsford they would be seeking to do it without him of course we know that the team really is dave browsford's baby i mean it, it it was pitched by him it was built by him it's been run by him and uh you know he's the, he's the link to sky the company as well that that's the person that sky the company have faith in so you know he's almost an immovable rock at the moment and in terms of the way the riders coming out and supporting Brailsford last night has played out I don't think it's really achieved the desired effect it certainly hasn't quietened anything down it certainly hasn't answered anything and it doesn't look brilliant that the riders have maintained silence on all of this and the only time that they have uh, have broken that silence is, is to come out in support of the boss who is looking pretty beleaguered at the moment it has to be said just another note Lionel on um, TUEs there you mentioned Froome's TUEs but it may also be that Froome feels particularly aggrieved because he feels that he was cheated out of another Tour de France if he felt that Wiggins applied for and obtained the TUE um, let's not forget 2011 Tour de France, but also 2012 Tour de France. Um, it may be that Froome feels that he's the rightful winner of that Tour de France. Absolutely. I think that's a very good point you make, Lionel, about the the rider's silence on, on all of this until, um, you know, the, the, there's this story that there's a, uh, you know, a movement within the team to remove Brailsford. Uh, uh, fine, you know, c- come out and support the boss. I think they're perfectly entitled to do so. But I think it would also be in their interest, each of them, to... Uh, well, the, the senior writers in particular, to open up about you know some of the the things that are being alleged about them and which you know which are causing them reputational damage, no question of that. I, I you know I think we can expect that Froome will do that at some point, but the other writers too, uh, some of them, uh, it would certainly be in their interest to open themselves up a little bit to to be very explicit about you know any TUEs they've had. I, I don't advocate this across the board, but I think in these particular circumstances, uh an unusual degree of openness and transparency would is is really what's required and uh yeah we'll see we'll see if that happens um i mean just a little add to our earlier discussion one thing that i've been keen to get to the bottom of was, was the the testosterone allegation that was in the sunday times which we mentioned earlier um that these testosterone patches were delivered in error to the, the velodrome in Manchester. I understand that Dr. Freeman um, would typically do his orders over the telephone, and on this occasion, uh, he ordered Instilogel, which, uh, when it arrived, was actually Testogel, and it was returned, and the testosterone, testosterone patches were destroyed, and there is a record of that. So the, the story of the testosterone, very eye-catching as it is, that may be a red herring. And, uh, you know, it's already passed into the narrative. It's become part of the narrative now that, Team Sky abused testosterone. It may that may not be true. And one one thing that did strike me was just if they were cheating with testosterone, because testosterone is cheating. There's no no there's no grey area there. It would surprise me if it was being delivered to the National Cycling Centre and stored in in a cupboard that presumably uh, several people had access to. But anyway, that's just a little addendum. I think this story of the 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 the, the Froome Brailsford power play is. Is, is is kind of where we're headed now perhaps that might become the you know the, some, something that we can ask sky riders about we will ask them about obviously um and uh, you know when Froome reappears in europe i think uh, the tour of uh, catalonia will be his 
his next race. Um, he's going to be asked about that, isn't he? And it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, and just on the way the story has played out, you know, it's become a, a almost a political um, story, really, rather than, you know, the, the question of, of wrongdoing, as we said in yesterday's part, centres on whether a, there has been an anti-doping rule violation. That is really the beginning and end of it. Um, at the moment, nobody has managed to prove that there has been. And yet there is this enormous swirl around what Sky have done, how they've attempted to explain um, the controversy that blew up as a result of the Fancy Bears hack. And, I, you know, while a lot of listeners were probably hoping for, you know, a really clear answer um, from somewhere. Um, and, and unfortunately, I don't think we're in a position to, to give it because we don't know all of the facts of what have happened because the only people that can provide those facts are uh, the people that involved directly in what happened in 2011 and we can only assume that uh, Dr Richard Freeman will be asked to answer what was in the package and what was given to Bradley Wiggins and when until we get any answer on that in the public domain and uh, you know on the record uh, we we can't really say one way or the other what the what the situation is and so when weighing up this whole story in my own mind i can see both extremes uh, on the one hand sky have you know they they've done wrong and dave Brailsford should go and on the other hand there has been no anti-doping rule violation and the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle right well should we wrap up there anything to add to that daniel are you going to return to your sick bed? I'm going to return to my sick bed, Rich. I think. Um, yeah, and just well, just very final point. Um, just to echo what Lionel said, really, that it's so difficult to navigate your way through this story, um, and particularly navigate your way through some of the reaction to the story, which is very com- compelling, very convincing, and no one wants to be made a fool of. No one looks as though wants to look as though they were gullible. Or, or fooled once again in the same way that they were or they might have been um, in the past in, in cycling. But um, the facts really at this stage are not mutating that much. Um, they're not evolving that much. We're, we're getting very little actual concrete information. And most of what people are reacting to is in itself reaction. As this episode was being produced, Team Sky made public a copy of a letter sent by Dave Brailsford to Damian Collins, the MP who is chairing the Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee. Together with a document addressing and refuting some of the points raised by the UK Anti-Doping Investigation and the Select Committee hearing. The document reiterates that Team Sky understand no anti-doping rules were broken regarding the administering of triamcinolone to Bradley Wiggins. It also states that reports saying that 70 ampules of triamcinolone were ordered by Team Sky in 2011 alone are incorrect. Team Sky says its records indicate 55 ampules were ordered over a four year period from 2010 to 2013. And so we go on, and here's some more. Uh, anyway, we should we should leave it there. We will, of course, return to it. I'll come next week to you from Paris-Nice and uh, pick up with you two chaps again in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Daniel. Thank you, chaps. You've been listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Thank you to Glass Pair for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.